everything up. Broadway, shop crowd, busted, mayonnaise, load it up. He got the hot dog, and he's, he's biting into the hot dog. He said, you know, can I get my change? He's, the guy said, uh, the Buddha says change comes from within. <laughs> I mean, that, that's classic, right? <laughs> I get you 14 dollars. <laughs> Work on yourself. Okay. So, I thought that would be a good stepping off point for what we're going to talk about. So, who and what is the course? So this whole concept of you are the course, but are you teaching it? There's a piece that comes out of my book, People and the Problem, that you have out there. And, um, you, the groups, and or the organizations you associate with or serve are a course, okay? So, like an academic course. And, uh, okay. So like an academic course, we're all, we all are a course. So in what way is your course similar to an academic course? Like an academic course, the content of your course taught that is taught best uh, with a structured, practical, accurate, and deliberate patient. In addition, when your course is taught and studied by willing and enthusiastic teachers and learners, the course can be passed with higher levels of proficiency. So let me talk about a course for a second. When I say that you are a course, I mean that literally. That you are a body of information that can be taught to other people. The question is how many of us teach the course to other people? See? Now, if I have people in my life and they're witnesses to my life, they are witnessing the life. That means they're experiencing the life. But they can only observe you physically. We can't see ourselves physically, but we can see from the inside out. Right? They can't see on the inside. Human beings can only understand what you do, how you behave, what you say. No one knows your intentions. We have to rely on your behavior. No one can read your mind. No one can know how you feel. You go around the whole world, smiling doesn't always mean laughter. It's symbolic. So it means different things in different cultures. So we can only rely on what you do. We are counting on you to tell us what's going on inside there. Think about it. You are the master of that information. And if you don't teach it to me, then you set me up to fail at that course. Now, if I am the person who sleeps next to you, that becomes a real serious problem. Right? Think about it. I don't know this person because they won't tell me, they won't teach me the course. So I keep failing. And so we're unhappy. Or if I go to work someplace and the organization doesn't teach the course, then how do I succeed in this organization when I don't know what the course is? I can't pass it. So think about my, my presentation this morning when I said I read your mission statement and your vision statement. I tell you, there were people in the room who didn't know it. They didn't know it. And if you don't know it, then you can't pass that course. Real simple. So if I show up in the library and you don't know that mission statement, then you may be at risk of delivering those services to Think about it. You run the risk of that. Moreover, um, you fail sometimes at fulfilling the expectations of those who are uh, your supervisors. Worse yet, we don't all function with it as a collective consciousness. So we're not all moving the same way in that organization, doing the same kind of uh, generic uh, deliverables for people who are counting on it. So if we all understand the vision and the mission, and we're all working accordingly, then management doesn't have to be around. See? I'll give you a quick example. My mother passed away a couple years ago, and I didn't have a father. She raised me by herself. And um, she had major heart surgery, had five bypasses, a heart valve, and all that, and um, lived a couple years after the surgery. So I had to find a rehabilitation facility for her up in Las Vegas. So I went around to all of the particular facilities in Vegas, and I walked in and talked to the directors, you know? And I said, uh, well, tell me why this is a good facility for my mother. <clears throat> well, oh, we do this, we do that. All these great services. And I said, well, we're going to take you on a tour. I said, no, let me go on my own. 
<laughs> I'm a, I have a doctorate in organizational psychology. Okay, so I applied it. I'm not gonna let you take me around and tell me what is. I'm gonna go around and see what is to catch people unexpectedly. Right? So I show. I went around and uh, I'd walk up to people and say, "What's the mission statement here?" So, <laughs> well, I'd see a nurse. What's the what are, your, what are your core values? What do you mean? Thank you. I don't want my mother in this place. How, they, how, how can I feel confident that my mother's going to get what she needs when the people don't know what it is that they do? They just know they have little chores. They don't know what this system is about. What makes it you know, efficient. They just do their little jobs. They're not going to go out of their way to deliver on the values or the vision or the mission. It's going to do their task. That's, that's an organization managed by objectives, by procedure, and policy, not by the passion that comes from living up a set of core values, the vision and mission. So then I finally went to one and asked the guy, I said, tell me what it is. He told me, that's okay. Um, I like to take a tour. Well, I suggest you just go on your own. <laughs> this man speaking with confidence. Okay, so I went on the tour and I stopped the guy mopping the floor. I said, What's the mission statement here? Our mission is to. Uh, whoa, janitor. Not an administrator. I asked the nurse. I asked, I asked the guy that was doing the volunteer, you know, the uh, transportation, the volunteer guys. I asked him what the core value was. All five core values. I went back and said, well, make me an application. <laughs> Come to this place. This is where my mother needs to be. And when I put my mother there, when she became conscious again, she was feeling good. I said, Ma, hey, I love this place. This is a good place. Thank you. <laughs> Interesting, huh? They were teaching those people in that organization what the course was, what that institution's course was. And you probably couldn't keep a job there if you didn't pass it. And they probably had it embedded as I suggest my clients do in the performance evaluation and in rewarding people who were caught living by those values and fulfilling the mission. And so everybody in the organization knows them. Everybody's going to be moving as one. You ever watch a professional athletic team, you know, or a ballet company or whatever, it's precision. It's synchronized. Synchronized swimmers, synchronized. They're all moving according to what the purpose is. Watch the football team next time, see guys going in one motion. The ones who don't are losing, usually. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with organizations and families. When people don't understand what the values are in a family or in a relationship, they start to go like that. Because they're not working on the same thing. Real simple, but very important. So structure is important. And Making sure that they're, they're practical, making sure it's achievable. You wouldn't want to talk about a vision and mission and values that no one can fulfill. Also, understand that people don't always get them right. right. And so, is it accurate? Does it really reflect who you are as an organization and as a person? Or are you really functioning with some values and some, some information about yourself that someone gave you and told you was important for you? Like, I went to boarding school in Vermont. And Boston College and a real elite boarding school, and most of the kids there were there because their father said, I went there, my father went there, you go. And then you're going to go to Brown, too. You're going to go to Dartmouth, and then you're going to come work in the bank. Because I did, my father did, so. That's not that person's course most of the time. And so people end up unhappy, stressed out, wanted to probably be a painter, you know, or construction worker, and he's being forced to go to the Wharton School where he could have been a phenomenal contractor or something, now he's a mediocre you know, investment banker or something. And stressed out or on drugs and alcohol and all kinds of things. Right? So it's very important. And then uh, deliver patiently. When we teach the course, whether it be as an organization or as an individual, when I'm teaching my course to you, I gotta be patient with you. Human beings are, uh, in all of the animal kingdom, and we are part of that, um, we're the slowest learners. None of us hit the ground running and eating here. I mean, <laughs> let's be real. Gestation period's real long, right? And even those who are, you know, are born small, 
And they get up running before us eventually. And they're hunting and doing all kinds of stuff. And you're still going, I want that. I want cookie. <laughs> you know, long time. Long time. You 10, 12, you still, when I get a call, I need to. <laughs> What's that? You know, you 18, I'll you, you know, trying to figure it out. 21, hey, well, I'm trying to think so. You know, you know? Boy, I got it now. I figured it out at 45. Now I got, I'm 55 years old. I think I'm, hmm. This is an interesting little creature we're talking about, this human being. Always trying to figure it out. The lion goes, dear, eat that. I'm going to eat that. You know, I'm going to go last night, I'm going to take a rest. You know, human being, I'm going to eat that, and then I'm going to go to the nightclub, and then I'm going to eat some more, and then I can't figure out why I'm stressed out. I'm doing too much, you know? So we take a long time to learn. But when we are willing and we're enthusiastic in this process, we learn more expeditiously. That's a fact. As a university professor, when students are willing and the teacher's willing, everybody's enthusiastic, and we're open to who we are, and we know how each other want to learn and have information delivered to them, then the learning becomes an, an enjoyable experience, and the learning curve gets accelerated. Okay? So, I'm now pushing this a little fast because this workshop plan is really a two-day, uh, eight-hour workshop. <laughs> so, light speed. All right, so, so, so what is the course? Content. Five pillars of self are the teachable constants. And this is my own personal research. They're universal and they're variant in their style, in their content. So no matter where you go in the world, the pillars that I'm going to show you are going to show up. No matter what culture, it transcends culture, gender, religion, economic, strata, you know, status, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, how they differ among people is unique and often unknown by others. And that's me teaching the course an empowerment strategy. So while they're the same, how they're expressed is different. For instance, what are one of the core values of the library? <laughs> we share information. We share information. That's a, so one of your core values. Do you think that you're the only institution with that as a value? No. Okay. Do you think if I went to another institution, it might be expressed differently? Yes. Ah, that's diversity. See? We think diversity is about race and gender and sexuality and all that stuff. So it's broader than all of those things. It's even about how you express you know, your core values. I mean, diversity is what is different, simply, simply put. And so um, how we express them becomes important, which also makes it very important that we teach them to, other, to each other. We can talk about diversity training and all that, but this is, for me, this is, a less, this is a more benign way of having a conversation about difference. See? But I'm putting the onus on you to teach it. In diversity, we put the onus on organizations to bring training to us and all that. But let me tell you something, folks. I don't need a diversity workshop. You know, I need you to understand that you have a responsibility to tell me who you are. And that I have a responsibility to respect that, honor that, and try to learn it. That's it. We've been getting to know each other since we've been on the planet. Now we need somebody to come tell us to get to know each other. Something's wrong with that model as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so here are your five pillars. How many of us are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Oh, All right. Who's your main, right? Uh, so, needs. Survival, shelter, socialization, self-esteem, self-actualization. Who in this room doesn't have those? Let me take away your cookie. You'll find out. <laughs> you all have it. I just come to your house and take that stuff out of your refrigerator for like three or four days. <laughs> You're choking me, man. Back my tweaky key. So, you gotta have it. You gotta, you gotta have it. Let me come take the roof off your house. And there's Fresno winter coming. I need it. And I'm not interested in anything else until I get it. Think about that. You take away your socialization. Walk in this room and people turn around and look at you and go, What you doing in here? What you doing in here? Uh, come to this workshop. No, you can't come in the workshop. I know y'all. Work with y'all. Yeah, we know. We don't want you in here. Back outside. 
they had a traffic stop. <laughs> <laughs> you feel pretty bad, wouldn't you? You feel rejected. Because human beings need group. We're vulnerable creatures. You go out that forest by yourself, something gonna eat you. You don't do well on your own. You're in trouble. You need a group. If we go in there as a band, with our equipment, our animals go, oh man, there's three or four of them, back up. Get back in the tree. You see what I mean? Seriously. So we depend on each other. It's tragic, like I say in my book, People Know the Problem, it's tragic that we start seeing each other's problems sometimes. When you're all I got. <laughs> you couldn't be a problem. Problem is a noun, person is a noun, two nouns can't be the same noun. I learned that in elementary school. Right? One noun can't be another, another noun. It's, it's not logical. It's a misuse of the symbol system we created. So when we do that, we get dissonance. We get dysfunctional. We start treating each other like problems. And which breaks down the very thing that we need, which is each other as a social, as social beings. Uh, self-esteem. Self-esteem. How I evaluate self. What value I put on me. Very important. When I get kicked out of a group, I don't feel very good. The group says no. What's wrong with me? I don't care who you are. If that happens to you enough, you're going to go, hmm. They all can't be wrong. <laughs> See? But we need you too. So we have to figure out what's wrong with the group. That we could accommodate one of our own. Very important. So those needs have to be satisfied. Then self-actualization. We all want to have them all realized at some point. We want to have them all functioning at the same time. But it's in flux. It never stays it's constant. Okay, it's always changing. The day you got the sandwich, tomorrow you're looking for one. You know? So, uh, ethics. We all have a sense of ethics, principles of right and wrong. That's in our DNA. We know when something's wrong. You could be in a room all by yourself. Think about it. No one's watching, you're embarrassed. How many people have had that experience? I know I have. I put up my foot, too. <laughs> you know, you're in a room all by yourself, you did something or thought something. Or <laughs> hmm. Nobody here but me, but I'm tripping. Yeah. You know? Because you've got that internal compass. You know what's right and what's wrong. Values, system of beliefs and ideals about what is good and desirable. We all put a value on things. Right? We all do. We all put a value on something. Uh, interest. How many people know what their own personal interests are? Honest group. I appreciate that. I really do. Because a lot of us don't know what our interests are. And they change. As we do. Sometimes the interest has to change because I've changed. I used to have a great interest in football. I had to give that up. One of the boys hit me now, I'm going to take him to court. Hit <laughs> 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 me now, I'm going to take him up. Give me some money. <laughs> That battery. <laughs> my body can't handle that no more. I barely made it in here. Right? So goals. How many of us set goals for ourselves? All right. Good. This is also an honest group. A lot of us don't set goals. One of the reasons why the economic downturn is difficult for us is because we didn't set goals for a scenario like that. See? We kind of react into the scenario. But you've got to be able to plan for certain scenarios. And goal setting is a very important piece of doing that. I don't just set a goal and just say, I got a goal. The goal is driven by some forces, some expectations or some thought about uncertainty that I got to take into consideration. Now, we do that naturally as beings, but we need to be more conscious and more proactive in doing that in our personal lives. So those are your five pillars. I wish we had the two days, because then we really just drill all the way down in there and get into work groups all kinds of stuff, but this is just a, a whet your appetite. And so what does it mean to have a course? To be aware that you are forever changing. That's a common thing for me. To have a compass for your life. How many people have actually used a compass before? They're fascinating pieces of equipment, aren't they? 
what an invention. If you haven't had one in your hand before, go somewhere and to us, to us, you know, a Navy Supply Store. I'm getting low on Navy Supply. I don't think they have that anymore. <laughs> okay, go someplace like that and um, and get a compass and just have it in your hand. And in point north, south, east, and west. And if you get in the you get in the woods, you can find your way north. If you know where you where you started from and was south, you not turn around and go south again. Right? So it's a f fabulous piece of equipment. But so our value, our course works that way for us in our personal lives. If you don't know your course and you get out in the world, you get lost. You forgot what your values were. Well, you never knew your values. Then someone else's values substitute for yours. Or someone else's course becomes your course. If you if you have the experience in your life of saying <coughs> often, saying, but well, it doesn't matter, whatever you say. Well, what would you like to do? Well, you know, whatever you want to do. If you have someone in your life and you say to them, well, what would you like to do today? Well, I don't care, what do you want to do? Uh, what would you like to eat? How would you like to eat that? Well, I don't care, you know. I'm going to identify that. It doesn't matter. You just go ahead and make that for us. <laughs> you hear that enough, you need to stop that process and say, no, you need to tell me what you want for them. Seems real simple, but it's important. Because everybody's living on your course. Doesn't seem like it, but they are. And if you pay real close attention, it's probably a constant through your whole experience with the person. Wanna go on vacation? Well, I mean, you want, I mean, you know, you pick it better than I do. <laughs> so ultimately, somebody's gonna discover their own course or get bored of yours. And they're going to say, oh, you were always doing what you wanted to do. Well, wait a minute. They're not going to remember that they didn't have a course and that they were living on your course all that time. And you might not realize it in the beginning because it feels pretty good to always make old choices sometimes. Get in your way. But in the long run, a negative connotation is placed on you as being selfish, self-centered. It's all about you. Okay? So, the responsibility for us is to, one, encourage people to teach us their course. But if you're that person that's not teaching others your course, the responsibility is on you to figure out what your course is so you can have a compass for your life. Right? Uh, to make choices after reflecting on what is important to you. To be consistent and accountable to what you claim to be true about your life. And if you're telling people <coughs> that this is your course, then you've informed the witness. You've informed the student that this is important to you. This is how you live your life. This is, this is your needs, your values, your goals, your interests, all the five pillars. And so then when you go off course, which you will do, if you're human, you will do that. Then you have the witness that goes, wait a minute, you told me, <coughs> how many people have children? No. Okay, well, you, then you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, you said. Yeah. Oh, mommy, I'll tell. You said. Now that's the magic moment in a relationship. Because you can't say, don't worry about what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your mother, I'm your father, you know, hey, hey. You can't do that. Because that's inconsistent with your course. Because you have ethics and values. So you have to say, mommy, sorry. You're right. Because that empowers the child that the course is of value. And that you're going to be consistent. And that they can count on you. And they can come to you when they're 50 and talk about what's going on in their lives. Because you're somebody who walked the course and lived it. And you didn't live a hypocritical life. What you said, you lived by. And when you told them to tell people you're sorry and forgive people, you meant it because you allowed them to forgive you. When you said, I'm sorry. That empowers the child to forgive the person who's their whole universe. Very, very important piece. And to be empowered to empower others and passing your course. So when you know the course, now you can teach the subject. How many people have taken college classes? Okay. You ever go into a college classroom and the teacher goes, all right, it's the first day of class. In fact, this is something I used to do. So you can get a chuckle out of it. First day of class, I'm going to take out a piece of paper, I'm going to give you your final. <laughs> <laughs> a straight face. 
Here you go, piece of paper. I see you. I see. I'll give you a final exam for the semester. Uh, you have uh, hour and a half. Uh, you'll find uh, you don't need a blue book or anything like this. Take out a piece of paper. I'm going to write the questions on the board. And then for the rest of the semester, we're just going to have a good time. And we'll bring in food and watch movies. And we'll get the free thing out the way right away. <laughs> How many students do you think took out a piece of paper? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> all of them took out a piece of paper, and all of them took out a pencil, and they're all prepared to take the exam. Believe it or not. Because people do what they're told in the classroom. Because I'm in charge. But when you know your course, you go, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for a course like this. I know what I need out of a course, and this ain't it. So I'm dropping this course. Never happened in 15 years.